Tag TV brings you daily news bulletin from India. Breaking news and views from India. Good evening, welcome to South Asia Newsline. I'm Uzma Jafri. Here are the top stories we are tracking for you. Indian PM Modi calls for reliable supply chain at SCO summit to foster economic recovery. Flood hit Pakistan battles soaring dengue cases after record monsoon. And Sri Lanka's crisis pushes war shattered Tamils to the brink. And now for all the details. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi called on leaders of regional security bloc Shanghai Cooperation Organization that includes Russia and China to address energy and food crisis sparked by the COVID-19 pandemic and the war in Ukraine. He also held separate bilateral meetings with leaders of SCO member nations to boost bilateral cooperation. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi called on leaders of regional security bloc SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, that includes Russia and China to address energy and food crises sparked by the COVID-19 pandemic and the war in Ukraine. In his speech at the SCO summit in Uzbekistan's Samarkand city, Modi said the pandemic and the crisis in Ukraine have caused many disruptions in global supply chains leaving the world facing unprecedented energy and food crises. SCO should strive to develop reliable, resilient and diversified supply chains to foster economic recovery, he added. He said we want to transform India into a manufacturing hub as he would investment. President Vladimir Putin said Russia was ready to provide more than 300,000 tons of Russian fertilizers stuck in European ports to the developing world for free if Europe agreed to further relax sanctions on Russian exports. SEO ko hamare chhetra mein bisvast, resilient aur diversified supply chains vikshit karne ke liye prayatna karne chahiye. Iske liye behter connectivity ki avashakta to hogi hi. Saath hi, yeh bhi mahatapun hoga ki hum sabhi ek dousare ko transit PM Modi also held separate bilateral meetings with the leaders of the grouping on Friday, including presidents of Turkey, Iran and Russia, and discussed ways to deepen bilateral cooperation. Earlier in the day, Chinese President Xi Jinping and Russia's Putin congratulated India on assuming presidency of the SCO and extended support for hosting the summit next year. Moving on. At least nine people were killed after a wall came crashing down in Lucknow city in India's northern Uttar Pradesh state following incessant rainfall on Friday. The weather office has issued a red alert for the state predicting extremely heavy rainfall on September 17. At least nine people including three children were killed and two others were injured after a wall collapsed following heavy rainfall in Lucknow city of India's most populous Uttar Pradesh state. The dead casual laborers and their families were sleeping when the incident occurred early on Friday. Those injured have been admitted to the civil hospital where doctors said that they were out of danger. The unusually heavy rain also caused water logging in several parts of the city and prompted authorities to shut schools and colleges. Lucknow District Administration has issued an advisory asking people to beware of old dilapidated buildings. Meanwhile, heavy rainfall also disrupted normal life in Uttar Pradesh's Gorakhpur city. Roads were submerged and people were seen walking in knee-deep waters. The India Meteorological Department has issued red alert for extremely heavy rainfall in parts of the state on September 17th. In news from Pakistan, widespread cases of waterborne diseases such as dengue fever have been reported in Pakistan after the devastating floods in the country. 
A government minister in Sin said more than 4,000 people are suffering from dengue fever in the hard-hit province and the tally is increasing by about 150 to 200 patients daily. Widespread cases of waterborne diseases such as dengue fever have been reported in Pakistan after devastating floods recently, Azra Fazal Pechuhu, Health Minister of Hard Hit Sindh Province, said on Thursday. Pechuhu said that according to the data collected by the Health Ministry in Sindh, more than 4,000 people are suffering from the dengue fever and the tally is increasing by about 150 to 200 patients daily. Record monsoon rains and melting glaciers triggered the disaster that has shown no sign of abating since the last month. The United Nations and Pakistan have linked the extreme weather to climate change, while some 600,000 people have fled their homes. सिम्टम्स के साथ भी आते हैं जैसे कि कुछ ऐसे पेशेंट्स होते हैं जो बहुत ज्यादा तेज बुखार होता है हड्डी तोड़ बुखार होता है और 5 6 दिन के बाद भी आते हैं तो फिर हम उनका डेंगी का टेस्ट रिपीट करवाते हैं अगर उनका डेंगी पॉजिटिव आ जाता है तो फिर हम उनको हाइड्रेशन के लिए कहते हैं तो उनको कहते हैं कि पानी पिलाएं अच्छी तरह और ईआर में भी डेंगी के बहुत सारे मरीज हैं ओपीडी में भी डेंगी के बहुत सारे मरीज मोहम्मद यूनस अ फार्मर फ्रॉम थट्टा सिटी इन सिंध लुक्ड इन डिस्मे एट व्हाट यूज टू बी हिज बनाना प्लांटेशन विद ऑल 21 एकर्स ऑफ इट नाउ अंडर वाटर he said that he has hired one of his workers to swim in the brown water to check if there was any banana crop that could be salvaged. Most of his workers have been out of work since the extreme weather destroyed the crops. The dead toll due to the deluge surpassed more than 1,500 on Friday, with more than 33 million affected, while homes, roads, railways, livestock and crops have been washed away in damage estimated at $30 billion. In news from Afghanistan, Taliban's Foreign Affairs Ministry has condemned the decision by the United States to transfer Afghan central bank reserves into a Swiss-based trust, saying it is unacceptable and against international norms. The Taliban said if the reserves are disbursed without taking into consideration the inputs by Afghanistan, the Islamic Emirate will be forced to impose fines and ban on such illegal activities. Taliban's Foreign Affairs Ministry on Thursday condemned the United States' decision to transfer Afghan Central Bank reserves into a Swiss-based trust, saying it was against international norms. U.S. Treasury announced on Wednesday that it would transfer 3.5 billion U.S. dollars in previously frozen Afghan Central Bank assets into a new trust fund that it said would be shielded from the Taliban and used to help stabilize Afghanistan's collapsed economy. Moreover, it could pay for critical imports like electricity, cover debt payments, protect Afghanistan's eligibility and fund the printing of new currency. Taliban spokesperson Abdul Qahar Balkhi said in a statement that if the reserves are dispersed without taking into consideration legitimate demands of the Afghans, the Islamic Emirate will be forced to impose fines and ban activities that facilitate this illegal venture and seek to misuse central bank reserves for humanitarian and other purposes. Though U.S. officials have had talks for months with Taliban and Afghan central bank officials, Washington has said no money would go to the bank until it is free of political interference, diplomatic parlance for replacing the bank's top Taliban officials, two of whom are under U.S. and U.N. sanctions, and anti-money laundering safeguards are instituted. In news from Sri Lanka. Thousands of Tamils in Sri Lanka who are still recovering from the impact of the country's 26-year-long civil war are dealing with a second blow due to the ongoing economic crisis. Runaway inflation has left them unable to afford basic necessities with several of them unable to work. As the blazing midday sun beats down on his back, 44-year-old Tamil labourer Singaram Susai Muthu lifts himself over his peanut field 
and tends to his patch of land in Mulaitivu, a town on Sri Lanka's northeastern coast that is still recovering from the impact of the country's 26-year civil war. On January 14, 2009, four months before the war came to an end, Susai Muthu was wounded by a shell attack and moved to a hospital. But in an airstrike that hit the hospital, he lost both his legs. Today, 13 years after the war, Susai Muthu and thousands of impacted Tamil population is being dealt by a second blow by Sri Lanka's economic crisis, the worst it has faced since independence. Before the current crisis, Susai Muthu worked as a fisherman. When the crisis hit, fuel shortages in the country left him with no income, so he decided to grow peanuts. <laughs> Thirty-eight-year-old housewife Sinthepan Kalachelvi has a similar story to tell. She lost an arm and a leg in a shell attack while she and her family were displaced in the final months of the civil war. Runaway inflation has left many of the Tamil population unable to afford basic necessities, with several people like her already unable to work. Sri Lanka's financial crisis is the result of the economic mismanagement and the coronavirus pandemic which destroyed its tourism sector, a key revenue earner. According to a survey, nationwide 31% of adult respondents said they are cutting back their food intake to feed their children amid the shortages. Moving on to news from Nepal. Nepal will take a decision on the recruitment of Gorkha soldiers in the Indian Army under the new military hiring scheme, Agnipat, following the November 20 general elections, Nepal's foreign ministry spokesperson Seva Lamsal said on Thursday. The recruitment of Gorkha soldiers was scheduled to begin on August 24 but was put on hold at Nepal's request. In line with the 1947 India-Nepal-UK agreement, India recruits Nepali soldiers for its Gorkha regiments with equal benefits and pension facilities. Nepal government has raised concerns over the scheme as per which soldiers will be hired for only four years with no provisions of pension. Gorkha soldiers have historically served for much longer terms in both the Indian and British armies. Members of the transgender community opened a restaurant in India's Chennai city on Thursday aiming to promote gender equality. Traditionally, transgender people have been confined to the margins of the society. India's Supreme Court ruled in 2014 that they have equal rights, but prejudice still persists. Members of the transgender community opened a restaurant in India's southern Chennai city on Thursday to promote gender equality. India's Supreme Court ruled out in 2014 that transgender people had equal rights but prejudice against them persists and they are often rejected by their families and denied jobs, education and health care. Many trans women, also known as hijras in India, survive through begging or performing dance at social functions such as weddings or selling sex. Yashika, a transgender and grandchild of owner of Snegethi restaurant, said that such initiatives will help break the taboo and bring about a change in society. This is a really uh, great thing and to be get appreciated. The thing is all about is all that uh, we have to just encourage all this. Because people like us, uh, we are still getting discriminated. And uh, the thing they get is now, the event is like that. It's totally being its development for our people. Traditionally, transgender people in India have been confined to the margins of society. India's 2011 census recorded half a million transgender people, but campaigners estimate the number at about 2 million. Less than half are literate and even fewer have jobs, according to the census. Well, that's all we have for you from South Asia this evening. 
now our viewers can watch the show on southasianewsline.com you can also visit us on facebook.com/sasianewsline and follow us on twitter at sasianewsline that's all in tonight's edition we will see you same time next week have a great weekend good night tag tv brings you daily news bulletin from india breaking news and views from india